Hello, and welcome to the Providence College podcast. My name is Joe Carr. Today's guest is Paul Coyne, class of 2008. Paul is a healthcare practitioner and entrepreneur working in New York City. He graduated from Columbia University Nursing School's master's degree program in 2015 and gave a very well-received and often viewed on YouTube commencement address, which we encourage you to check out if you get the chance. Paul is among the best credentialed of all PC graduates with two bachelor's degrees, three master's degrees, including an MBA, and a doctorate in nursing practice from Columbia, in addition, of course, to his professional licenses. He joins us today from New York, where he is an assistant vice president at the hospital for special surgery. Greetings, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we've been looking forward to this for a long time um, and really happy to be able to share your, your fascinating and inspiring story with our fellow alumni. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit about what life is like these days at an urban hospital at this stage of the pandemic. Yep, so my hospital is an orthopedic hospital, um, number one orthopedic hospital in the country. And uh, overnight last March, um, we transformed pretty much in one weekend to a overflow COVID hospital where we, where we turned our 200 beds and our ORs into a COVID facility um, and went from doing orthopedics to, to med surge and ICU to, to care for people. Um, with COVID. Uh, we've transitioned back now to, to a primarily orthopedic hospital, uh, which is our, our main function, though we do uh, partner with New York City to administer the COVID vaccination. We have two sites in partnership with New York City, um, where we've vaccinated over 30,000 um, New Yorkers, including many of our own staff. How long ago were you able to make that or begin that transition back? Um, last fall, last, late last summer uh, and, and early fall. Those. I see. Interesting. And you told us a moment ago before we started recording that you're just coming from a vaccination clinic, which you run. What are the sort of individual interactions like for practitioners in, in that setting when people are so grateful and one would expect in many cases even emotional about the opportunity to get a vaccine to, to start to work our way past what's been such a very, very difficult year plus? Yeah, no, it's very, it's very moving for for me and for everyone in, involved, as you said, people are very emotional. This is, for better or worse, um, for better and worse, the COVID um, crisis has sort of equalized. Um, many people showed some disparities in many ways, but also equalized us um, in our humanity that we're all vulnerable to receiving, uh, you know, to, to getting this vac um, disease. And as a result, the cure um, very rarely does the same medicine that a practitioner is giving to a patient also is also the same exact experience that they're receiving themselves. So at the onset of the vaccine clinics, we would literally, a nurse would give the vaccine to another nurse and then they would switch and the nurse would give it to the, to the other nurse. Um, so it's been very remarkable, um, every, very emotional tears, um, a lot of tears of happy um, and relieved people. And it's, just, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of it and be able to um, be in a position to do it. Can you reflect a, a little bit more on a year ago when the crisis exploded? What was your day-to-day -day role at that, at that point in time? Yep, so one of my responsibilities at the hospital is for occupational health, employee health. Uh, so we have 5,000 employees. Um, and my role was to ensure their safety and um, care for them. And so... Uh, everyone was very scared, um, myself included. And um, I took uh, the phone and forwarded it to me 24-7. Uh, uh, the occupational health line um, was forwarded to me and a couple other individuals. We took turns um, answering the calls of employees who contracted COVID or who just were afraid that they had COVID or if they were exposed to COVID. All of the examples that you could imagine um, would, call this, would call us if they worked at, at our hospital um, and for, to ask for guidance. Um, and at the time, we, we, we've learned a lot more about the disease over the last, uh, the virus over the last year. Um, at the time, we didn't know too much and, and just tried to offer comfort and any of the advices as, as, we, as we could. So it was, um, again, very humbling to, to do it um, and balance being afraid myself <laughs> and also uh, trying to tell others, you know, trying to help others when they were afraid. It must have been incredible to witness the their heroic efforts. That word is not overused in this case of your colleagues and so many people who, while as you just mentioned, and it's so important to remember, being scared yourself to have to be 
just in this crucible day mm -hmm. after day after day, an incredible experience. Yes, you know, it really was. And it brought out, um, you know, the best in a, in a lot of people and colleagues that you didn't know that well, when you see them do that, it just makes a, um, a great, a great bond, I think, between colleagues and then the organization. So I think we came out um, stronger. It's not over, you know, yet, uh, but, but uh, that surge um, in May and in April of last spring was in New York City was very, uh, was difficult to, to watch. Can you tell us a little more about the Hospital for Special Surgery, a great orthopedic hospital? What, what kind of work happens there? Sure. Um, we're the number one orthopedic hospital. So hip replacements, knee replacements, spine surgery, um, foot and ankle, any surgery for anything orthopedic. Uh, and then we're also, um, many people just know us for that, but we're also the number three hospital in the United States for rheumatology. So dealing with rheum rheumatological conditions such as lupus, um, autoimmune diseases, um, we, we, we treat uh, all of those as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a, remar it's a remarkable place. We're in, in partnership with Cornell Uni University for a lot of the orthopedic training and the, and the academic training. And it's a, it's a great place. I've been there uh, four years and, and really enjoy it. Interesting, interesting. With our alumni guests on the podcast, we always like to hear about uh, a person's road to Providence College. Yeah, no, I was thinking of this today. I had a feeling you were going to ask this question and I was thinking of it all day today. Um, my road to why I chose to go to Providence College, right? Is that what right. you're- where, where did you grow up? And what yeah. sort of influences did you have around you that might've pointed you in this direction? Yes, yeah, no, it's the best um, best decision I, I ever, well, my wife, I'm married now. So there's some other good decisions I've made since then, but it was one of the, one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, my wife is up there too, I'm happily married. Um, I grew up in Marlboro, Massachusetts, um, about an hour away from Providence College, right up 95 and then 495. And um, I <clears throat> was raised by my mother and my father and my grandmother. Um, all lived together, I'm an only child. And I had some medical um, things that are, which are pretty public and I'm sure we could talk about them, you know, at, 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 I'm sure that'll come up. Um, mm -hmm. But I had some medical conditions in, in high school that uh, led me to spend a lot of time in the hospital and uh, was spent a lot of time at Boston Children's Hospital. And um, as a result, didn't want to go too far away from Boston Children's Hospital for, for college because I didn't know if I would need them again. And, and also didn't want to go that far away from my, my family. And I drew an hour map around um, an hour radius map around uh, my house and um, applied to pretty much every school in that map. I think it was 24 schools. Um, and I remember them all laid out. There was no online applications then. It was a lot of paper. Uh, and so I can still see them all at my parents' dining room table with a check uh, next, next to each one for the application fee. And my dad and mom just said, look, let's see, you know, where you can get in and where you want to go. And, you know, let's just apply to everywhere. And then you can pick, you know, why be disappointed if you, you know, let's just do it that way. So we were fortunate enough to be able to do that. And um, we did. And um, I visited Providence on accepted students day after I got accepted. And uh, I was, went to St. Dominic's Chapel and there was the mass that was happening. And uh, Manny Vasconcelos, who's uh, now Father Manny, he's a, he's a priest, he's, he's a graduate two years above me, he was cantering the mass. And I just had this feeling come over me. I can't really describe it. You know, I'm a I'm Catholic, you know, Providence College Catholic, so it, perhaps it was God, but I just had this feeling come over me that I, that I would kind of, that that was the place for me. It felt like home in that, in that accepted Students Day Mass, and he was singing. And I thought to myself, like, you know, in two years, I'll, I could sing the Accepted Students Day Mass and be, you know, be like him. And he graduated, you know, two years before me. So the last two years, I was the cantor at those Accepted Students Day Masses singing. And, you know, that just that feeling that I had at, at St. Dominic's, it just kind of came together on that Accepted Students Day. And, and that's where, that's where I, I told my parents I wanted to go to, go to Providence. It was, it was a great decision. Well, Father Manny has been a Providence College podcast guest. So we've, oh, wonderful. we've closed that circle. And by the way, a circle with Marlboro, Massachusetts at the center and a, a one hour away um, variable there would probably pick up as many colleges and universities as any place in the world. So, That's right. Yeah, I had, my, I had plenty of, of choices. It's not like Providence was the only one in that hour. I really had a lot of choices and picked Providence. Let's talk a little bit about your PC experience, Paul. You were certainly a student leader, a Friars Club president. Um, it seems like you really thrived in this environment as a student. 
Yeah, it was. A, I I did uh, the first you know three or four months. I uh, struggled kind of to find my way. I remember I was at Guzman, um, and I like I said I was in in the hospital a lot in, in high school, and so the first three or four months was quite an adjustment for me to, to sort of assimilate into the college uh, life and experience. Um, but eventually, you know, found found um, liturgical choir, found concert chorale, found Friars Club. Um, was fortunate enough to to get to get in and. Um, ultimately became president of Friars, like you said. And, and those are kind of the three big things, you know, Friars Club and singing and, and just everything else that, that people do in college was just a great experience. Um, but the main two things for me really were Friars Club and, and singing. And I really enjoyed um, all of it, but um, those are the two big ones. And you earned a, earned a degree in American studies. Who were some of the, the professors and others who may have influenced you in particular during your time as a PC student? Yeah, uh, Professor Manchester was was very extremely influential as the as the um, facilitator of the American Studies program. Um, and then Father Nikonor Astriaco, you know, even though I only had him in one one class, really was a, a great um, spiritual, you know, advisor. I'd go to him for advice and and mentorship and uh, some of the things he said I think of all the time even still and then probably the greatest uh, influence in terms of, of in terms of faculty was was brother Kevin um, who I was had the, just the great fortune of, of knowing who's, who's since passed away but great fortune of knowing in his capacity as Friars Club moderator um, and that was the year I was president the year right before he passed away and so he started to get 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 a little sicker in that um, that relationship with me and him being so close um, really, really had a profound impact on on my life. So, well, yeah. he certainly did influence generations of of students in Friars Club. Yeah, members in particular. By the way, Professor Manchester and Father Nick are still very active, very much involved, and they'll be uh, glad to hear that uh, yeah. you remember them fondly. So, from PC, it was off to Wall Street, and let's get into that uh, medical situation a bit because you had a life changing event that really kind of altered your trajectory at the age of 22. Tell us about what happened. Yeah, I was um, I just a, a week out, um, about a month, two, two to three weeks out after I graduated Providence College. And uh, I had already accepted a job at Goldman Sachs. I was fortunate enough to, to be hired there um, and I suffered a stroke. I, I, I went, I was having a chicken, chicken parm dinner um with my girlfriend at the time and uh, just my right side went limp and I was an EMT uh during college and sort of knew the signs and symptoms of a stroke and I, I said I think I'm having a stroke and um I was rushed to to Boston Children's Hospital again and uh had a, had a stroke uh, so I I had to recover pretty quickly uh, I was sort of faced with a choice of delaying the start of Wall Street career and sort of spending more time to recover or just sort of going all in and seeing what I could do. And um, you don't get a, an opportunity to have a great job in New York and uh, sort of restart that. Um, and so my parents and, and, and I just felt it was best to try and, and move to New York. I had a great friend from college who was the vice president of, of Friars Club, uh, Vincent Casido, who graduated with me and, and was my roommate the first four or five years in New York, who I don't know if I could have done that without him, um, but we moved to New York and and got an apartment together in Hoboken. And I had a lot of long term memory loss, difficulty speaking, um, a limp. Uh, but the worst part was probably the memory memory problems and and the inability to really speak well. And started my job at Goldman though, and everyone just thought I was shy. Uh, I, processed, I traded derivatives. So it was a lot of computer work, uh, three monitors, and you know a lot of work on the computer, and not a lot of talking. And um, was able to keep my job, you know, during the Great Recession of, of 2008, and um, kept the job for three or four or uh, four years while I while I recovered. Um, and it was um, it was sort of the perfect job for me <laughs> at that time um, because it didn't require all of the deficits that I had. Uh, I, I was able to do that high functioning job but it didn't really show any of my deficits. So it was a perfect job for me to start, start a career. What was it that, that triggered the transition to becoming a medical practitioner? Yeah, so um, since it's Providence College, I'll give the full, full truth, because Veritas, <laughs> uh, but I, um, I, I developed, sometimes I just say I wanted to prove to myself that I was smart and I wanted to give purpose to what I went through. That's my quick answer. 
But my honest Providence College answer is I had, um, I developed what's called uh, tonic-clonic spasms where the lesion in the left side of the brain um, sort of manifested itself in a seizure-like activity where the right side of my body would uh, become very rigid and, and tense up and shake. And it hasn't happened in a long, in, in, in a long time, in, in probably seven or eight years now, but it was happening a lot um, during that period. Four years after I fully recovered, this new symptom sort of manifested. And so I had worked all very hard to get better. And then here's another setback of not being able to really perform this job because it was happening a lot at Goldman. And we tried a couple of different things. We tried monitor screens and, you know, they tried all this different stuff to make them not happen, but they kept happening. And so they put me out on long-term disability and, um, you know, again, uh, was told that I was sort of disabled. And the same thing happened after a stroke. You know, some doctors say you can't, might not come back, you know, all these things. And then you come back and then, you know, here it is again, they're telling me maybe my brain can't handle X, Y, Z or whatever. And I, you know, I can't do the computer screens. I can't do this. And so anyway, I had these, these events, these, these shaking rigid events um, where I'd fall over on the floor and sort of convulse um, and was out on long-term disability and was just sort of feeling like I wasn't um, capable and um, was wondering if I would be able to to overcome this now because I thought I had from the stroke and now this new new symptom was manifesting. And it was a, um, it was a, it was a, a, a time of a lot of prayer, uh, to be very honest, where I, I really thought about where Providence, uh, that part of Providence really came back and helped me. Um, and my friends from Providence all, you know, emailed me and stayed in touch with me because they knew I was going through a, a low time. And um, one of the things I don't talk about very much, but my girlfriend from Providence College passed away that year, actually. So there was another sort of tragedy in all of that. Um, we had it was a separate story, but she she passed away. Um, so that was very um, upsetting, too. So it was just a very, very tough time. And I wanted to um, overcome and also prove to myself that I was smart and give purpose to what I went through. So that's the full story. And I thought, you know, what can I do to sort of never have all of this be a question again, where if somebody's interviewing me on a podcast, they don't just say, oh, well, that's, you know, you really tried. Um, I wonder if your brain is back. Like, I just couldn't live with that question. Um, I wanted an, a question of, of knowing to myself that I was back and that I found new parts of me that, that, that weren't even there before the stroke and that all the other parts of me were as back as well as they could. And that I was, could be a fulfilled, you know, human, human being. Um, and I just knew the only way that I could do that was to um, go to school. Uh, and, and that's really the, the full truth. I've actually never said it on a, on a podcast like this, but I, Providence is the, is, is the place. Um, so that's the, um, the, the truth. And I, I just want to, I just didn't want to be sick. Um, is the is the honest truth, and I went back to school, and I I got a bachelor's, like you said, a master's and a doctorate from Columbia, and at the same time I went to Northeastern and got an MBA and a master's in finance, and I, I completed all five of those degrees in four years, and um, it really was as if every time I I got a new diploma every year, my parents would go to the commencement, and I would you know be like not not yet, and really it's that doctorate when I walked across the stage, it was like I went to sleep. The way I describe it is, you know, crying, crying one night that I, I wouldn't be what I dreamed of becoming. And then just kind of walking across the stage as someone called me, Dr. Paul Coyne. Um, those four years are kind of, uh, you know, I, I remember they're, they're it's, it feels sort of like a different, it really kind of feels like different people along, along the way. And sometimes I have to stop and be like, they're all, they're all me. Cause now I have a wife and a son and, you know, it's just, a, it was a different period in my life, but at that time, uh, that's what I needed to do to, to, to be to be fulfilled in the future. And I, and I knew it, and, and so I did it. What an incredible and inspiring story. I, thank you so much for yeah. sharing that with us, Paul. It's uh, it, amazing. Five degrees in four years. <laughs> I've never heard of that before on top of everything else, but incredible. So uh, why nursing? Yeah, so I mean, the role of the nurse is the, is the role that I think is best able to heal uh, the physical and the um, emotional aspects of a patient. You know, I think, you know, I just alluded to some of my own emotional struggles. I think everybody has emotional struggles. Uh, certainly people with lifelong heart diseases, like, like I have, I need a new pacemaker in June. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, my life is, 
is uh, you know triumphant in what I just described, but I still have a heart disease and I need a new pacemaker in June. So you know, there's life. Uh, everyone loves a story of here's the struggle and here's the triumph, but you know, there's still a struggle for anyone who's even triumphed. Um, so I still struggle sometimes, and you know, everybody struggles. So I think the role of the nurse is the best able to to both address the physical and the emotional aspects of of what is needed to truly heal. And that certainly was the case for the nurses that, that helped me. And I, I wanted to be able to do that um, for other people. And so that area of medicine where, you know, I'm now I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm a prescriber. I can prescribe medications and you know, I'm, a, I'm a prescriber. So, you know, the fusion of, of medicine and nursing um, in the role of a nurse practitioner, I thought was the best um, avenue for me because I thought I could uh, make the most impact. Might like to come back to a little bit more about the nursing profession in a couple of minutes, but I do want to make sure that we talk about your your role as an innovator and an inventor. Tell us about In and Inspire and the company where you're a co-founder. Yep. So about five years ago, uh, I met two people in Colombia that changed changed my life. One is my wife, who I alluded to earlier. And she's She's wonderful. And she was a, a nurse practitioner now as well. And the second is Mike Wong, who, who, who was the CEO and founder of, of Inspiring. And uh, the, the two of us co-founded this company together uh, about five, five years ago now. And um, our COO is, is Vin Casito, who I mentioned earlier, who was my roommate, who's a brilliant software um, and op, uh, implementation consultant and, and now uh, excellent COO. So the three of us sort of co-founded this company together, um, first Mike and me, and then very quickly Vin um, from Providence um, as well. So the device, um, we partnered with NASA and MIT engineers to create one device that would go on the wall behind a patient bed. Uh, and we use computer vision um, and machine learning and artificial intelligence, as well as Bluetooth low energy, which is the same signal that your cell phone pairs to your car radio speakers. Uh, to analyze the physical and digital environment of the entire patient care um, space. So it's um, it's a very innovative piece of hardware, I guess is the short way to describe it. The longer way is what I just said, but the short way is an innovative piece of hardware that goes inside the patient room to improve patient safety, patient outcomes, and, and patient satisfaction, um, really to augment the care team um, and and unite the care team with the patient and their family alleviate the burden of charting and manual work that a clinician has to do so that they're able to spend more time helping the patient heal rather than documenting what they're doing. What sorts of things can be charted by this device? What, what does it spare the practitioner from having to take care of? Yeah. So we know um, a great example is a turn in positioning. So a patient in a ICU or a patient that's in, not capable of getting up on their own needs to be turned and positioned every two hours. And that means a patient, a nurse goes in, they turn them to the right side of the body. So the pressure's on the right hip. So they don't get a pressure ulcer. Two hours later, they go and they turn them to the left. So that, that currently um, our device looks down at the bed, sees if a patient is, hasn't been turned in two hours. We actually know through skeletal uh, computer vision tracking and artificial intelligence, we can tell if the patient hasn't been turned. We alert the nurse to go turn them. And then once they do, we're able to say the patient has been turned. So that whole process of needing to remember to do it, doing it, oh, you still have to do it, but needing to remember to do it and then documenting that you did it. Currently, they would then go back out in the hall and say, I turned this patient at x y. So now that's just sort of done. Another very easy thing is, is for falls. If a patient's getting out of bed, we can alert and say patient's getting out of bed. So there's, there's a, um, there really isn't an anything, any piece of digital equipment that comes into the room or any manual action that a nurse takes, we're able to harness with that um, data hub, the device, and then transmit it to a cloud and then to the electronic health record. I was reading about this and, and saw some discussion of the fact that it keeps track of who has been in the room. So who has visited the patient and there's value in that too, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I have a, you know, I mean, from a patient level, you know, I had a stroke but if you don't need a stroke. It's very confusing. Even if you have a full brain when you're in the hospital of all these people coming in and out, um, you don't know who they are. And, and uh, so even for the patient to service that information to a patient so they can see, you know, physical therapist, Bob saw you, nurse Paul saw you, Dr. Smith saw you. Um, and then they can share it with their families, perhaps remotely. The family can see everyone that checked on the patient that day. That's for the patient level. And then for the hospital itself, the implications to staff efficiency. Um, to give assignments based on time spent. 
So if a nurse has five patients, if there's two nurses and there's 10 patients, you have to give five to each of them. Well, which five do you give and how do you allocate that? So we're able to say, okay, last shift, these five patients took up X amount of time. These five took up X amount of time and then balance the, the workload amongst time spent and patient demand um, so that the people, so that one nurse doesn't get all of the patients that take up the most time. So there's, there's a lot of um, staff efficiency um, tools that we can do with some of those metrics. We also have a gamification app where we reward nurses for spending more time with patients. We give virtual trophies to the nurse who spent most time with patients that week. So like I had said about why I wanted to get into nursing, one of the reasons why I was sort of disappointed a little bit when I got into the field is that a lot of the work, um, I felt the technology was pulling the, everyone sees this. If you go to a primary care visit, the, the, they're, they're typing. You know, um, the technology is standing as a barrier to or as actual a deterrent where, the, where they're not there, um, where technology is drawing the clinician away from the patient rather than uniting them. And so this piece of technology very deliberately behind the bed serving as a uniter um, to, to eliminate that barrier and then encourage more uh, interaction. It's really interesting to note that this is invented by nurses. And obviously the fact that you had that exact set of experiences that led you to understand exactly what's needed here. It really, it really fits. What's the future of this product? Yep. So we have a team of um, nine full-time now, about 30 contractors. Um, we're currently expanding pretty rapidly into um, hospitals, um, nursing homes, and, and the home. Uh, there's some, there's some real, um, there's a, there's a need in the home market for it as, as well. Um, so it's just, I just want to get it into as many uh, places as, as I can. Uh, I really, I believe in it. I think it will um, change the way that care is delivered and in so many ways and bring, and bring better for patient safety, which is why it sells to be very honest, because there's a hard ROI on stopping falls, stopping pressure ulcers, Columbia university partnered with us and did a big research that's coming out next, next month on, in the academic journals on on how just just how much um, you know uh, improvement is made in the hospital by having this device there in terms of hard ROI on safety protocols. But really, for me personally, just to create an environment like the one I just described, uh, you know, I'm very passionate about it. And obviously, keeping patients safe is prior, is number one. But if we can also keep them safe and then have a better experience simultaneously, it's just it's a it's a win win. And so um, I'm excited to get it in more as as many places as as we can. So there's. There's probably, I think, seven hospitals that have signed letters of intent. We're deploying all throughout this spring. Um, during COVID, we deployed it at a couple hospitals in New York, and we actually used it as a contact tracer because the same computer vision that knows all that that I described also knows who comes in the room, how long they stay, if they had a mask on, and if they were within six feet of the source patient. And so we're able to do contact tracing for infection prevention like COVID. So um, that's, that's another use case of why it was deployed uh, during the, the pandemic in New York, but now all of these other use cases are, are being able to be, um, realized. And so I just, yeah, I just want to get in as many places as, as I can. We should point out that this is getting a lot of favorable review by tech organizations and your peers. You were honored at South by Southwest and you personally were named one of modern healthcare's top 25 innovators. So getting some well-deserved uh, notice for this. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been a great a great journey. And like you said before, as a nurse invented company, I think a lot of these um, products are, are um, derived out of, a, out of a boardroom of people who want to make money, um, which is always great, I guess. But, but this was really born out of a clinical necessity and a problem that, that nurses saw. So it's, it's wonderful for, um, for, for our company, but it's also wonderful for any clinician or really any person. Um, to believe that they that they can um, start something and 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 do do something that's that's remarkable because I don't like I said at the beginning it was just me and one other nurse um, and we raised money and we found NASA engineers and we just emailed everyone we could until we got enough of the right people together to sort of make it happen. There wasn't anything. The most the most remarkable part about it was the grit and the will to keep sending those emails and finding people. Not that I'm um, a brilliant hardware engineer who can, um, you know, put the computers pieces together in this device. That's somebody else does that at our company. But um, so I, I think it's a great story of, of, of anyone who doesn't think they can do something that, that they can. In the introduction, I mentioned the talk you gave at your 
master's degree graduation at Columbia in uh, 2015. And we'll put the link to the YouTube video in the chat. It's really in the show notes, I should say. It's really worth watching. But there's a great line in there. When you were talking about uh, responding to people who ask you, why would you want to be a nurse, especially after having worked on Wall Street and, and having done some other things? And you said, why would I want to do anything else? So in that context, what kind of satisfaction does this job bring to you? Being a nurse? Yes. Or being yeah. a nurse. I'm uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. No, because we've talked about two jobs. <laughs> right, that's right. <laughs> they both bring me great satisfaction. Um, but being a nurse um, brings me great satisfaction to see um, more directly the impact that the, that I can have on on humanity. Um, what in the financial markets they're needed for the the world to function as well. So anyone's job, not to not to minimize any any role, every job in in the world um, adds value to humanity. Um, but for me, I felt as though I needed to see more directly the um, the impact that I had on a one to one basis um, with 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 other human beings um, to to help them and then in turn realize more about myself and and grow grow together and I've done that um, with my career with the people I manage with this product um, and and also in during you know, direct clinical practice and so I think any that that's really that's why it's been most fulfilling because it is the role that allows people to be honest and sincere and and vulnerable a little bit and and really um, get to the core of what being a, a human being is about. Medical professionals, Paul, have always been afforded a measure of respect, but that's been significantly elevated during the pandemic and, and rightly so. Have you been able to notice and experience that or, or are you still kind of in the moment? Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I'm going to get emotional. Um, no, my eyes just spilled up. Um, I think, yes, I have, uh, or my eyes wouldn't have just spilled up. I, I um, One of the most moving things um, we we just moved my wife and I um, to a, to a home so that my son has more more space. But when the pandemic started, uh, we were we were living on the Upper East Side of of New York in in Manhattan. And every night at seven, uh, they would clap, and um, uh, it was just it was it was extremely uh, moving um, to to feel like the the world was was recognizing um, what what we were trying to do and coming together um, that way. And I, I remember holding my, my son who was like six or seven. My wife is a frontline nurse practitioner. So at the, you know, I'm, I'm more in administration. So I do see patients. I have to, I have to wear, you know, a mask when I go to work and they're in the elevators and stuff, but I don't spend, you know, 30 to 40 minutes with them at a time anymore because I'm the administrator. But my wife is a, is a frontline GI, uh, gastroenterology nurse practitioner who wears an N95 all day um, with the goggles and comes home with her face looking like you see on TV with the, you know, she's still beautiful, but she's still, you know, she has the, the goggles and everything and the, and the lines from the goggles. And I just remember holding my, my son in, in that window and seeing, you know, cause it's New York. So there's, just, you can see everybody. It's not like you live in the, out in the rural area. You see thousands of people just looking out the window and everybody just stopping and, and clapping. And, um, you know, I just remember holding my son saying, you know, like they're clapping for mommy, they're clapping for mommy. And it was just, um, so I, and, and a little bit for me, I feel like, you know, more for my wife, cause she's like really the front line and then me a little bit in a support role. So, but really I, I did get to feel it uh, with that, with the clapping. Well, that was uh, an emotional thing for all of us to observe from, from a distance. So it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be really in that and to be part of it. And in fact, to be one of the people being saluted and, and recognized yeah. and, you know, Thank you, you know, for what you do and, and for what your yeah. wife has done. I don't think we can say that enough. Uh, what impact do you think this will have on the nursing profession? Will it draw more people in or could it have the opposite effect? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been studying this, you know, very closely and I'm involved, you know, at the national level with various organizations of, of nurse innovators. And there's a lot of stuff happening in the in the space that's, that's remarkable. I, I think um, it, it's there's a I hope it draws more people in. I think, you know, if you read the, um, I think it was a Washington, just today, there was an article that was, that came out about three in 10 healthcare workers, you know, are burnt out and are looking to go to another profession. Um, I, I hope not. Um, I think there's already a shortage. Um, you know, the, the, the baby boomer population is aging. This is all very well, you know, documented and known that, that, that there, there needs to be more <laughs> caregivers to care for the, the aging population. 
Um, and I think, uh, I, I hope, I hope more people, uh, are drawn, drawn into it. I do think some companies are taking the opportunity. There's great innovation that comes from any, um, you know, challenge. Um, my concern, you know, my company, I just described how we are, you know, creating technology that, that unites more, more, uh, there's a concern like that, that I have with, with technology that goes in the other direction where we have less clinicians, more technology, and the problem that I just described is worse. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about creating a technology and, and helping create other technologies that um, allows the clinicians that are here, even if there aren't as many of them proportionately, where there is a technology that really augments the care that they can give so that they are able to care for more people in a meaningful way so that they are, their time is spent caring rather than you know charting. And so I, I, hope, I hope it's both. I really do. I hope more people get into the profession. It's extremely rewarding. I would recommend it for anybody. Anybody from Providence, please you know, reach out if you're listening and you want to go into the healthcare profession. I'm happy to speak. I, I, I hope everyone, um, I think it's, it's, very, it's, it's extremely rewarding. Um, but if it, is, if it is the other way, I hope that, 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 that the technology part doesn't drive it even further away and that there's more technologies like mine created that allow that great caring of the caregivers that are there to care for the people even even more. You've been very generous with your time, Paul. After a long day's work, we should point that out. And we want you to have some time this evening with your, your wife uh, and the little guy. But one last thing I, I wanted to ask you about, and you're a person of science, a medical practitioner, and, and you've studied uh, this exhaustively and everything related to, um, to your profession. Talking about this clinic that you were working at today and the vaccinations, can you put into perspective, from your point of view, what an achievement of science it has been to create these vaccines in this time frame? Uh, I think it'll be remembered as one of the most significant um, scientific feats uh, in the history of, of, of mankind. Um, the amount of things that had to happen for, the, for, for, for us to receive a vaccine um, is, 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 uh, remarkable. I, I would be on for another hour if we tried to dissect all of them. Um, but, it, but, you know, to, to create it, number one, um, there had to already be a lot of years of past scientific discovery and progress that was made that was now accelerated. Um, the amount of hyper-focus of an entire world on one thing, um, I don't know when that hasn't happened since probably World War II, um, where everyone is the entire world is focused, and not even that because some countries weren't involved in World War II. I mean, this is every every country, uh, the entire world was focused on COVID. Um, you go anywhere in the world and say COVID, and someone will know it. Um, that doesn't happen um, really ever. And so the amount of effort in the scientific community to be able to be hyper focused on this one thing, and all work together. Um, and break down the barriers of different nations and business gains, all these things, um, just, just uh, geopolitically um, is remarkable. And then to create the su supply chain and the manufacturing and all of that. And then for the businesses to say, all right, we're not gonna think about money, we're gonna partner with each other and we're gonna do these different things. And I guess they still think about you know, money somewhere in there, but their primary goal is really to fix this, fix this is remarkable. And then for all these, the end people like me who are helping run vaccine centers and the clinicians um, to really, um, I mean, people all have another job. I think, you know, there wasn't just magically more doctors and nurses to administer vaccinations because we had to. Um, all of these people have other things to do. Um, so it's been, um, so the amount of effort that they have to do to do whatever their real, their regular job was, plus now give time to vaccinate, you know, the leadership at HSS, all of the directors, vice president, you know, whatever level there are, if they're clinical, they're involved in this vaccination effort. They're, they're going at least one day a week, they're vaccinating while they're running the hospital. So, you know, I think, you know, the amount of time that people had to give to do this, even at the, at the end, is, is remarkable, but all of it, particularly the creation of the, of the vaccine itself is, is, is remarkable. And I'm sure your second question is, you know, 
what advice would I have to people who are still not not getting vaccinated? Um, I, 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 uh, you know, I, you know, I, I hate to say something is you know is safe, and you know, I run for governor like twenty month, twenty years from now, and they go, oh, you know, Paul was Paul was wrong, you know. Um, but you know, I think if people trust, um, if people trust taking a Tylenol, if people had trusted getting the flu shot before, if people, had, unless you're completely like, I don't believe in medicine at all. And I, you know, which is your right as a, as a person, I guess, in, in America to, to believe what you want. But if you believe in any part of medicine, I don't understand why this one would be any different is, is my honest. Um, it's my, that's my hundred percent honest answer. Um, and that's how I, you know, everybody's a little, this is new, you know, it's emergency youth authorization, the FDA didn't, you know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why people, I guess, would would not. But um, if that's my advice to people is if you if you didn't if you take Tylenol, if you've had a surgery, if you've if you've taken any medication in your life, or if you've gotten any vaccines, I don't know why this one would be any any different. Well, thank you for that, Paul. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate that. We appreciate your your candor and your insights. And most of all, we really appreciate what you do in, in your professional life and your innovations that are aimed at, at helping people, helping people make people's lives better. And that's a, a great thing to be able to focus on in one's life and to be able to achieve as much as you have and as much as you will. It is wonderful. It reflects very, very well on our alma mater. So thanks so much for your time. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to, um, to do it without, without Providence College. I, I really mean that. So it's an honor to, to, to have the opportunity to speak with you. You too. Well, we'll stay in touch and maybe we can catch up again sometime down the road. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. You can subscribe to the Providence College podcast at all the usual places, and they're available on the college's YouTube channel. Feedback is welcome at podcast at Providence.edu. Thanks to our producer, Chris Judge. I'm Joe Carr. Until next time.